Welcome, folks. This is Steve Adubato on AM 970. This is the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour with Mary Gamba. Mary, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Every time I say, oh, what are we going to talk about today? You realize that the subject, the topic of leadership is complex, multifaceted, and you can talk about it forever. Forever and ever and always. It just keeps going and the list keeps getting longer, but all great topics. Why don't we let people know how they can check us out and find out more? Definitely. Well, the first place is our website, stand-deliver.com. What do they find there? And on there, we have lots of great resources. We have articles that you've written on the topic of communication, leadership, mentoring, leading great meetings, everything having to do with communication. Communication How and about leadership. if they want to find, watch this self-promotion. What about if they would like to purchase one of my five amazing books? Oh, they are all amazing and information is on there as well. And they can also follow you on Facebook if they don't want to wait to get a book. It's just instant communication sure. from Steve Adubato. And that is Steve Adubato, PhD, and that's spelled A-D-U-B-A-T-O. And they can follow you on Twitter as well at Steve Adubato. And also, we have some new and exciting things to share. We have a podcast that is available. It's on Apple iTunes as well as on Google Play. Wow. Enough of self-promotion for uh, right it's now. It's never enough self-promotion. I would agree with that because being a self-promoter in a strategic way is part of being a leader. And as people know who uh, check out the Leadership Hour every Sunday on AM 970, we always have a fascinating, compelling uh, leader that we learn from, that we listen to, that we engage in conversation and today is no different. Uh, for the first time, we are welcomed by Mr. Ray Butkus, who is the founding director for the Center for Leadership Studies at St. Peter's University, also executive lecturer at the School of Business at St. Peter's University. Ray, how you doing, my friend? Good afternoon, Steve. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Great to have you. By the way, Ray, uh, set us up. Tell us what the Center for Leadership Studies at St. Peter's University is. Absolutely. The Center for Leadership Studies is a new organization that we founded at St. Peter's that focuses on two dimensions. First is the development of student leaders, and we do that both through academic pursuits as well as experiential learning pursuits. The second aspect of it focuses on thought leadership, faculty scholarship, faculty teaching excellence, both oriented towards the field of leadership study. So I'm curious about something. Do you believe, Ray, from your experience, that you can quote unquote teach leadership or the age old adage that some believe, come on, we know that great leaders are born, you say? Well, this is a question that I think thinkers of leadership have debated probably since the time of Aristotle. Simply put, are leaders born or are leaders made? And the debate rages uh, still. I come down on the side, uh, and I hope it doesn't sound overly diplomatic or wishy-washy, but they are both born and made. Mostly, mostly, they are made. In other words, people can learn how to be good leaders. Now, will they have, will everyone have that essence, that secret sauce of leadership that would motivate every subordinate to follow him or her? Well, perhaps not. But there are some general rules. There are some general principles that can be learned by everyone. It takes hard work. It takes study. It takes practice. But yes, leadership can be work. If I didn't believe that, I would not be here, and I wouldn't be wasting my time attempting to teach leadership to 20-year-old and 22-year-old undergraduates. I want a quick follow-up on this because Gene Kronaki, Dr. Gene Kronaki, the president at St. Peter's University, who, by the way, just joined us on State of Affairs, uh, which is the second half hour. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is the second half hour of the Leadership Hour, so make sure you stay tuned for that as well. But Gene and I talk about political leadership all the time, but go back to the 20-year-olds, as you just said, this whole quote-unquote millennial uh, conversation. I coach and, and mentor in a lot of organizations and teach, as you well know, 
uh, a lot of leaders who say, you know what, it's, it's almost impossible to teach and coach and mentor millennials when it comes to leadership because, you know, there's something about them. They're different. They don't have the degree of loyalty. They jump around so quickly. They're hard to engage. The social media thing makes them more difficult to be present, blah, 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 blah. You say? I say, fair enough. But are they more challenging to lead than a 20-year-old draftee during Vietnam War who didn't want to be there, who faced daily danger, and who oftentimes had nothing to go home to? No. Are the current millennials a challenge of leadership for certain, but it's a different kind of leadership what do you mean? that's required. What do you mean by that, right? Different kind of leadership. It's a leadership that has to be mindful of the particular requirements of followers. So every leader has to be very, very conscious of the type of followers that he or she has. They also have to be very mindful of the situation in which they are leading. Change any of those things and the leadership dynamic changes. So today's millennials, for all of the reasons that you mentioned, lack of affinity towards institutions, propensity towards instant gratification, <laughs> the ability to have access to instantaneous communications make leadership more difficult, more challenging. But it doesn't relieve the leader from the obligation of finding new ways, finding new techniques to motivate those followers. We're listening to uh, Ray Butkus, who is not just an executive lecturer at the School of Business at a terrific university, St. Peter's University. He's also the founding director for the Center for Leadership Studies at St. Peter's. Steve Adubato here with Mary Gamba. Brian Brodeur is uh, in the studio as well. I'm curious about something. Because also Brian experiences this as well. There's a whole range of millennials running around here leading things every day at East Main Media. I'm curious about something. Mary and I have this conversation as well. You invest time. You invest effort. You spend money coaching and mentoring and training, quote, unquote, millennials. And the fear we often have is, listen, they're going to leave you anyway. They're only going to be with you for a few years. So why spend all that time, money, and effort coaching and training and mentoring them? Because they're not that loyal, quote, unquote, to institutions. They're not old school like us or just basically old. Mm. You say, Ray Butkus? You know, I think I'm going to paraphrase Tom Peters. And by the way, folks, Tom Peters, a great management and leadership guru in the 1980s and 90s with Waterman, an incredibly uh, iconic book. The name of the book is In Search of Excellence. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mary's sitting there going, how did Steve know that's that? That's impressive. Well, that's okay. That's what Perhaps I Perhaps one of the best business books oh, I've ever read. Absolutely. And in fact, I have the opportunity to speak to undergraduates every professional day of my life. And I said, if you're going to only read two things, <laughs> read the paper, a good, high-quality newspaper every day, and read In Search of Excellence. What a book. So Tom Peters said that very good leaders produce excellent results and excellent subordinates. But excellent leaders produce excellent results and other excellent leaders. So it's a long answer to your question, Steve. But the reason to develop those is for them, for the period of time that they may be with you, to get to be better leaders in their next pursuit. So leadership is about not simply finishing a task or accomplishing a task of your own that has to be done within your own organization, but it's preparing the next generation of leaders. Now, if that next generation of leaders executes their mission in a different organization, a different company, so be it. But you know, people have the way of crossing paths again and again, and I've had, and I'm sure you've had in your career, opportunities and circumstances where a subordinate may have left. That's right. And then years later, five years, 10 years, you cross paths again, and they mention, hey, by the way, you know, I picked up so-and-so from you. So I think that's the reason that you would do it. Well, stay on this. This is fascinating because Mary and I often talk about different people who have crossed our paths over the years. 
And there was a young woman, I don't know how, Mary, how many years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago. Remember Whitney? Mm-hmm. With yeah, the, the I knew that's woman, where you were going, yeah. Yeah, a young woman by the name of Whitney who was just an absolute superstar. And we knew early on that she was a superstar. Mm-hmm. And she had it. She had everything that you were looking for. And we did everything we could to keep her. And I remember when she left us, I was like, mm-hmm. oh, God, like, what are you going to do? And I remember... About two or three years later, I was doing a, a guest shot on the Today Show, and Whitney was the coordinating producer of the segment, and I had no idea. And I walked into the studio to do the taping, and it was Whitney mm-hmm. at the NBC studio at 30 Rock. And I became very emotional, and I, so did she, and we hugged each other. And she actually said, and I'm not saying this for self-promotion, she said, I can't tell you how much I learned when I worked with you guys. And I thought to myself, but you left us. Yeah. <laughs> so come back. <laughs> but I didn't say that. And Ray is, I think what you're saying, Ray, is is it our job to coach and mentor and help people become the best they can be, even when and if they leave us? Absolutely. There is Ouch. no question about it. Preparation of the next generation of leaders is central to the excellent leaders mission. It's why excellent leaders are excellent leaders because they're producing that next generation. But we want them to stay with us so our organization can be better, right? Absolutely. And many times they do. But even if they don't, it's the right thing to do. Wow. Yeah, I tell you what, the Jesuit training going on at St. Peter's University, that's part of it, I've got to believe, which is there is a greater good. There is a greater responsibility that we have than just, hey, This is good for us. Am I making too much of that, Mr. Butkus? You are not making. Ignatius Loyola himself, a 16th century Spanish nobleman, understood that if this Society of Jesus was going to grow and prosper, that he needed to produce excellent leaders who could operate independently. And we attempt to infuse much of our learning here at St. Peter's with the kinds of principles that he articulated 450 years ago. It's so interesting as we uh, finish up, so much of what Ray Butkus is talking about at St. Peter's University is that the essence of leadership, even though social media is what it is, information technology is what it is, instantaneous information communication, it is what it is, they are what they are. At the core, exceptional leadership, what it takes, hasn't changed all that much, all right? Let me leave you with this, Steve, and I think you're absolutely correct. Leadership is not a position. It's not a job. It's not a title. It's not some nine-to-five endeavor that you turn off when you leave the office at five (laughs) o'clock. So true. It is a 24-hour-a-day pursuit, and great leaders are constantly leading, and they lead with constancy. Their subordinates know they can be counted on, especially when the times are rough. And maybe that means periods of competition. Maybe it means massive layoffs or personal crisis of the subordinate. But the leader demonstrates, the excellent leader demonstrates in ways great and small that he or she is worthy of their subordinates' trust. It means leading always, even when it's easier to follow, easier And maybe you would prefer to rest. Easier to ignore when a subordinate needs guidance. Easier to do the expedient thing than the right thing. The leader leads all the time. Ray Butkus has given us so much to think about. And it's one of the reasons, one of the core reasons why Mary and I love doing this show. Uh, Isn't just because we're talking about our view of leadership, but we're listening to others who have different experiences, uh, different orientation, educationally, professionally, philosophically. We learn from those folks more and more about the essence of leadership, and that's why we're so pleased to have Ray Butkus, who is the founding director for the Center for Leadership Studies at St. Peter's University, also an executive lecturer at the School of Business. Ray, I want to thank you for joining us, and we learned from you. Uh, All the best to you and your colleagues at St. Peter's University. Steve, thank you so much, and it was a pleasure to be on the Leadership Hour. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. I got to tell you something. It's interesting, and I mentioned the Jesuit thing, and I'm not going to get overly philosophical and religious, but because my older son happened to go to Fordham University, which is another Jesuit university, and I know my dad actually went to St. Peter's University, there is something at the core of Jesuit training, and it's less religious than it is a question of humanity and what responsibility we have 
to others. It's much more philosophical and spiritual. And in a funny way, that is the essence of leadership. It's servant leadership, other-centered. Does it resonate for you at all? It does. It's funny. I, I think this is our, gosh, 22nd episode of is the that, Leadership you, Hour. Are we that well. far? Is we, it tw- we're getting there. Is that true? Maybe 21. We're getting there. Okay. 20th. Well I always Well into feel. the double digits. Well now. into the double digits. Go ahead. The point is, I never thought as we go through the topics, leader as human being. And I know that sounds very what do you philosophical. Mean? But By the way, you're listening to Mary Gamba, Steve Adubato here, the Leadership Hour, human being. A human. Leader. And I think often when you think of a leader, we've talked about athletes, we've talked about CEOs, we've talked about Donald Trump, we've talked about actors, musicians. You think of them as almost greater than anything, larger than life. But at the core... To be a great leader, you need to be a good human being. And I never really thought about that until just now, listening to what he was saying and thinking of others instead of thinking of yourself first will get you the outcome that you want to have as a leader. And there's so many things that uh, Ray Butkus from St. Peter's University said. When you listen to people who have different ways of looking at things, it challenges your preconceived ideas. I'm going to go back to the thing we've talked about, about coaching and mentoring and investing in people. Ray was literally saying that even if they leave you, they leave your organization, that means you no longer have the services of this person who is contributing to the bottom line, who's contributing to the productivity, who's contributing to the effectiveness of your organization. It's the right thing to do to help that person gain the leadership skills and tools to go on to do something else. I'm thinking, no, I want them to stay. And so do you. I do. Well, some of the people that we've had in our tenure together, maybe I was kind of happy that they moved on We're not and pursued about them. something else. We're talking about the really good potential stars. There is nothing that feels better, again, as a human being. You mentioned earlier Whitney, but we've had so many others come through our doors as a stepping stone, and then they move on to do something different. Because but I don't want to be the stepping stone. I want to be the place that they stay. Yeah, but they're finding petty, their way. It? it is petty. Thanks and for confirming that. That's okay. That's what I'm here for. Keep you grounded. And um, just figuring out, though, watching them grow, and it's almost like being a parent. I said, I finally feel like an adult. It's so funny. Something happened when I hit 40-ish. And I finally feel like I am that parent figure, if you will, to the people on our team, the The same way that, yes. And watching them grow, teaching them. I hate that we even call them millennials, but it's a way to just describe that. They're in their early mid 20s. And, but just watching them grow and evolve and overcoming all the stereotypes that usually go with that designation it makes me very proud to see them grow and learn and evolve. And if they stay, that's great. And if they go, however much it hurts, hopefully there's always someone else that is going to come in and it gives us that opportunity to lead. It's so interesting. By the way, if you want to find out more or check out past episodes, Mary said we're into our 20s of Leadership Hour. How can folks Mm -hmm. do that on the uh, podcast? Yeah, they can subscribe to our podcast on Apple iTunes as well as on Google Play. And if you just want to find out more about Steve and what we do at Stand and Deliver, you can go to stand-deliver.com. Or if you are a millennial and you need instant information, (laughs) follow us on Twitter, uh, Steve Adubato, that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Facebook, Steve Adubato, Ph.D. I want to try this real quick. By the way, the book that was being referenced, uh, Peters and Waterman, the exceptional book, I believe it was written in 1984, In Search of Excellence. It was really the first book that got me interested in the subject of leadership. What's so fascinating about it is that Peters and Waterman, if you go back and look at this, studied organizations that they considered excellent. About four or five years later, half those organizations didn't exist. Many years later, Jim Collins wrote Mm -hmm. Good Good to to Great Great about exceptional organizations, what made them go from good to great. Several years later, many of those organizations did not exist. Now, there are some, I'm not going to get into a philosophical discussion, like Peters and Waterman... Yeah, they wrote an interesting book, but they were wrong because how could those organizations have been excellent if they didn't exist any longer? How could Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, be that great if some of those organizations failed and they were supposed to be great? And I thought to myself, no, it's not exactly it because they were great. They were excellent at the time, but either, as Woody Allen once said about, check out this non sequitur, Woody Allen said about relationships, either they keep moving forward or they die just like sharks. He said, relationships are like sharks. 
Now you're sitting there going, why is Steve talking about that? <laughs> Trust me, I've got a rationale for this. I, I'm following, maybe. If an organization does not move forward, if an organization does not evolve, if an organization does not change, if an organization says, we're excellent, we're good, we're staying the way we are, you're dead. Right in that moment, you are guaranteeing your professional death. Agreed. We see it all the time. We see it with uh, local toy stores. Well, big, not local toy stores, but Toys R Us. And, Blockbuster. Yeah, exactly. Kodak. Oh, yeah. Research in Motion. Um, what did they produce? Yeah, BlackBerry. Exactly. Large, huge, amazing organizations that at one time were great. However, you will fail if you don't keep moving forward and you don't evolve and you don't adapt to change. And he, again, when Ray we had, Butkus. yeah, I was just going to say Ray on the line, he had really talked about being mindful of who you are leading. And that goes for these organizations as well. Sure, they're not leading their customers, but in a way you are. You're leading your customers to buy into your product, to buy into hey, you need to go to this store to watch a video and pick up your VHS tapes. And so it's a matter of changing and evolving based on your key stakeholders. You know, it's so interesting. I'm not going to make this a commercial for Starbucks, but I do go to Starbucks. And I think you should tell our listeners how you get your coffee because it's hysterical. A little sidebar. Why would you embarrass me <laughs> on AM 970? And Why would you do that? Okay. You don't have to share. Okay. You ready? Yeah. They may want to follow and try it. Here it, might it is. Be good. A venti... Skim cappuccino, half calf, semi dry, extra hot. Why is that relevant? It's fascinating. For it's five dollars, I'm getting what I want. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can continue. Oh, but I that's digress. not the point. The point is this: the local Starbucks by us in our hometown of Montclair is shut down. Why? Because they're going through renovations. So I had to go to a different Starbucks. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? It's because the physical setup in that Starbucks was not conducive to what the customers wanted. It was crowded. You're on top of each other. Where the it line was, was mixed with the tables. Exactly. It was just bad. You didn't have a place to go where you could get it, your work exactly. done. Exactly. And so I'm thinking, and I would go there and pick up my coffee and get out of there. And sometimes I would want to stay and do my reading and stay out of the way of what's going on in my own house. But here's the point. I think Starbucks figured out that the physical setup of the store was not conducive to what customers wanted and needed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, okay, they're making a lot of money. You know, Charles Schultz, the founding CEO, writes all these books about we're the greatest. And okay, fine. But even if they don't evolve, did I get that wrong, Brian? Howard Schultz. Oh, my God. Did I say Charles? You know who Charles Schultz is? Isn't that the— Charlie uh, Brown. Yeah, peanuts. Charlie Brown, the Peanuts. Howard Schultz. Well, one makes great cartoons, the other one makes great <laughs> coffee. I mean, they're both leaders in their own way. And Starbucks does not have peanuts. Um, that's totally irrelevant. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say in this long-winded explanation is that if you just say, we're going to stay the way we are mm -hmm. because we're number one in the market, and you're a fan of the other place, uh, Dunkin' oh, Donuts. Oh, Dunkin' Donuts, all are the way. They, are they, someone but says, again, just they're... stay with what you have. McDonald's, stay with what you have. Mm -hmm. I think you can stay with some things, but great leaders are constantly – constantly asking themselves and their team members, what do we need to do mm -hmm. to be more relevant and accommodating to our audience? Exactly. But at the core, you do need to stay true to who you are. So that's the challenge. What, what does that mean, true, this, uh, Dunkin true Donuts, to who you are? If all of a sudden it's a donut Dunkin, and coffee. Yeah, but if they all of a sudden changed their formula because they thought Starbucks was doing better and they wanted to uh, compete with Starbucks, I would be very disappointed because it's two totally different types of coffee. Hold on. So you want consistency. I want consistency, but I do like change to a degree to remain relevant. Stay here. You ready for this? I drink Diet Coke. Mm -hmm. Too much of it, and I'm trying to stop. You remember years back in the whole, you know, Coke and Pepsi thing that's oh, been yeah. going on forever? Coca-Cola decided that they were going to, quote, change, right? The new Coke. Right? You ready? We've got leaders at this not-so-small company <laughs> with a research team, with a marketing team, with focus groups, and they go, yeah. We've got a new Coke. What's it called? Was it called New Coke? I think it was called New Coke. Can I we think check that's... this out, team? Yeah. I don't know if it was called New Coke I or think whatever. It was, Co yeah, I think that, but I could be wrong. I don't drink that. But I do think Nobody it's, wanted it. Nobody wanted it. Because that there's was change, also- though, no, Mary. There's change for the sake of change, but then there is change to remain relevant. If all of a sudden Coke wasn't flying off the shelves anymore, which I'm sure that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. They just wanted to do something different. Yes. Is that not strategic leadership? 
It confuses your customers, though. If you do that, hey, I liked it the way it was. Why are you tweaking it? I never said I didn't like it. Well, we thought you'd want something new. Maybe I didn't want anything new. I like Coke the way that it is. And what they have to do, they had to go back. Brian, what do you got? The unofficial name was New Coke. <laughs> they didn't rename it. They See? just said the formula is different. It's still Coke. Yeah. No, it was at a different logo. Yeah, but it was New Coke. Like, that's, yeah. yeah. It's the unofficial name of the reformulation. Mm -hmm. It's even a bigger screw up. Oh exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah. what, they even rebranded wrong. Just you know what? Coca Cola. It's different. There's a, it. Steve Adubato here with Mary Gamma, Brian Brodeur, and uh, this is the Leadership Hour. By the way, stay tuned in about uh, five or six minutes for State of Affairs uh, with Steve Adubato. It's our public television program we do in cooperation with our friends and colleagues at NJTV out of the Agnes Vera studio. It's also seen on Fios and other places as well. The Leadership Hour has state of affairs in the second half hour, but trust me on this, there's a point. Let's even think PBS. Mm -hmm. PBS is PBS. We've been part of it for 25 years. We've been part of PBS. PBS is going to be just PBS, and they're going to stay the way they are because everyone can count on them. Well, Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street had a place for a very long time, and there are still a lot of people who watch the reruns. But PBS has to strategically evolve as well. Or are they just going to change and be more commercial just because everybody else is? That's not strategic. Right. So is this a long-winded way of saying you have to change, but you can't just change for the sake of change? Exactly. You need to balance your desire to rebrand yourself, to have something new. It's more than rebranding. Correct. It's not just name stuff. It's adapting whether it is a product, a service you're providing, the way that you're leading your team, the way that you're communicating your external customers. It is about balancing and listening and hearing what your key stakeholders are looking for. You know, it's interesting. I'm coaching in an organization right now where one of the issues, Mary and I set up these leadership academies, which is a fancy way of saying we have a bunch of people we coach and train mm -hmm. in one of the organizations one of the leadership challenges that a lot of the participants in the Leadership Academy bring up is we're having change fatigue. Mm -hmm. And there's so much change going on, they can't keep track not only of the changes, but why the changes are taking place. And it's a very difficult conversation to have with the quote unquote leadership of this very large organization because the leaders decided we're going to change. And we change is important. And there's so much of it that folks not only can't keep up with it, but they're struggling and trying to figure out the strategic reasons for it. And it's not been communicated as effectively as it should. And that is a challenge in a lot of larger organizations. We have a small organization. There's 10 of us right. in our small nonprofit. And it's That's a lot- That's the production company. The production Not to be said, confused yeah. with the for-profit, for where we try to actually make it. money, right. stand and deliver. So these enormous organizations, you're talking hundreds, thousands of employees, right. if they try to initiate change or too many of them, you're going to confuse your employees because they're not going to know, number one, like you said, why are we doing this change? How is it going to take place? What part do I have? And even worse, they may think that they don't have a, a role or a future in whatever change is taking place. So it's not good. That's so interesting. Uh, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba here with Brian Brodeur. And one more item because we've got about three minutes left. We are talking about millennials, student leadership, teaching leadership. Ray Butkus said something else. The whole age-old question that he said has been going on since the time of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Our great leaders made or born. This is my view of it. And by the way, if you want to express your point of view on this, uh, write to me at mm -hmm. Steve Adubato on Twitter, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, my email is... Steve Adubato. At Gmail. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. I believe that certain leadership traits you see in kids, I'll see it on my, our son's baseball team. He plays baseball for one of the local high schools here. And I see it. There's certain kids. They're 13, 14, 15 years old. Mary, you see it with your oh, yeah. kids 13, on the hockey yeah. team, right? And my 13-year-old, he was born a leader. Okay. For sure. mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I see it. I see my son running off. He doesn't run fast, but he runs off of first base after the end of every inning. He hustles. He cheers for the other kids. I see it. And I'm proud of him for that. Of course, he got it from me. Oh, that not running fast he got from you? So I'll leave that alone. But here's the thing. But really growing as a leader, beyond those natural mm -hmm. traits you see in a kid, really growing as a leader, getting better as a leader, evolving as a leader, that ain't born. That's made. That's learned. Mm -hmm. And it's maintaining that open mind that you can be a leader. 
And as you said, because, and again, not to make it about family, but I have two children. They have totally different communication and quote unquote leadership styles. But it's not to say that there aren't opportunities for someone that doesn't believe that he or she is a natural born leader to step up and lead. Someone says, I'm not a leader. Steve, why? Why are they coaching me? Why did they get you to be my coach? I'm not a leader. I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. Because leadership can be taught. The skills, the traits, the tools to be a good leader can be taught. It's just easier for some people to learn those tools than it is for others. It's like learning a foreign language, really. I can't learn that language. Mm -hmm. But you can. I am 100% convinced that you can teach someone if they're open-minded. You were not a great public speaker, nor did you want to do it, and you said it's not me 18 years later. I know. Here I am, and I love doing what I do. This is fun. How'd that happen? Because you gain little tools along the way or big tools along the way that then you put into your mind, and it just helps you to become a great leader and a great communicator if you believe that you can do it. And also Mary was forced to be in positions where she spoke in public and got uncomfortable, and as I've said a million times, Mm -hmm. great leaders get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Exactly. But we're so comfortable together here. Another great leadership hour here on AM 970 and also our podcast, Check It Out. This is Steve Adubato. That is Mary Gamba. And stay tuned for State of Affairs with Steve Adubato. And uh, I'm sure we're going to have some compelling public leader talking about some important topic. And once again, I've learned a lot. It was great. And also thanks to the folks at St. Peter's University and Ray Butkus for joining us. Check us out next week. Thanks, folks. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At RWJ Barnabas Health, we believe that everyone needs to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, the law firm of Gibbons PC, New Jersey Resources, Summit Medical Group, a physician-owned multi-specialty medical practice serving northern and central New Jersey in 70 locations, Verizon, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Everyone deserves a healthy smile. And by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Promotional support provided by ROINJ, Informing and Connecting Businesses in New Jersey. And by Insider NJ. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is a very important United States Senate special. Um, We are now joined by Republican candidate for the United States Senate, Bob Hugan, and um, welcome. Great to be with you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. In the uh, second half of this program, you'll be joined by the senior United States Senator in the great state of New Jersey, Robert Menendez. Uh, By the way, you were just telling me before we got on the air, this wasn't your plan to run for the U.S. Senate. What changed? No, I, I've had a great life. You know, I was born in Hudson County, grew up in Hudson County, raised my family, with my wife in Union City, uh, sorry, in Union County. But we were, frankly, we were just morally offended that he was going to be reelected virtually unopposed. Senator Menendez. Senator Menendez, virtually unopposed, after all the things he'd done, violating federal law, abusing the power of his office, and frankly, failing the people of New Jersey. Ineffective. 25 years in Washington, 16 years with a Democratic president, and New Jersey's dead last. We get the lease back from Washington of any state in the country. The people of New Jersey deserve better. So it's interesting. Uh, by the way, Senator Menendez will be here to uh, respond. He will not see this interview. But the fact is there was a um, – that trial that the federal government brought, it did not succeed in finding him guilty. The federal government opted not to, not to pursue it. The United States Senate, quote, seriously admonished the senator. But, um, and, and said he was guilty of violating federal, he violated federal law in, in the letter. Not the courts, no, the, the U.S. The, Senate. Yes, bipartisan. Okay. Let me ask you this. Since you mentioned uh, character in office, characters in office, Donald Trump. Yeah. How much money did you contribute to Donald Trump when he was running in 2016? And if you contributed that much, what did you see in him 
as a leader that caused you to say, yeah, he's the right person I, to lead our nation? I did contribute to the Republican Party primarily was my contribution. What, what I saw in 2016... But you gave to him as well. I, yes, but the majority of my contribution to the Republican Party to support the general election. <clears throat> what I saw in Washington in 2016 was we were stagnating, and it was not good. It needed disruption. Well, unfortunately, we now have dysfunction, and the reason I'm running is because we can do better. We've got to let good people who are going to lead with integrity and honor and are going to put the people of New Jersey first, not party and politics. Mm -hmm. I've been a collaborator all my life of working with others to produce results, not just talking about results, but delivering results. It's not about talk. It's not about party. It's about results, and it's about people. Is Donald Trump a person of character and integrity, in your opinion? I don't, I don't think he leads in the way that I would want to lead. I want to bring people together. I want to put people ahead of a party Character and politics. And yeah, I, I think I've led my life in terms of when I, when I was the first in my family to go to college, I joined the Marine Corps after I graduated college. I was the only person right, in my thank class. Thank you for your service. Thank, and and, and I've, I've tried to raise my family in that same way of responsibility of doing things. My daughter works at Chobani Yogurt in New York, which is a great company. Both my sons are infantry officers in the Marine Corps serving our country. So I, I've led my life with integrity and honor, and I set the values for me. And this race is about New Jersey, putting the people of New Jersey first to make sure we deliver sure. for them. It's partly about that. A lot of it is. It's also about who will stand up to President Trump for those who have serious problems. Forget about policy for a second. Right. I'll get off the Trump thing in a second. Yeah. His demeanor, his leadership style, his tweeting and spending time saying that uh, 3,000 people did not die in yeah. Puerto Rico and it was a Democratic hoax. When you see that and you realize that you contributed to the Republican Party who contributed to him becoming president, not to mention what he said about Senator McCain not being a war hero and you giving your service to this nation, I'll get off after this. How much of that bothers you? It bothers me a lot, Steve. We need leaders who are going to stand up and do the right thing to bring people together. We've been too long, too partisan in this country, whether it's Senator Menendez, President Trump. We need to stop fighting each other and working together for solutions and lead with honor and dignity. That's why I've led my whole life. I've been independent my whole life. As I told you, I was the only person in my class to go in the Marine Corps. I went to a company almost 20 years ago with six weeks of cash where everybody said, don't do that, Bob. Selgene? Yeah, when I went to Selgene, six weeks of cash the company had. Everybody said, don't go there. I've been independent in my life all the way. I'm going to stand up against anybody who does anything that's not good for the people of New Jersey. I'm not beholden to any including political... Including the president. Absolutely, including the president. Remember, I'm not beholden to any political organization. Mm -hmm. I didn't become the mayor, the assemblyman, the state senator, the congressman. I don't owe anybody, anybody in a political organization. I'm not filling out any special... self-funding to a large degree? Virtually, yeah. The campaign is pretty much self-funded. We're due raising a little bit of money. But also, I'm not taking, I'm not follow, fill, uh, filling out any mm -hmm. special interest questionnaire. When I go to Washington, I'm going to stand up for the people of New Jersey. That's what this is about. And by the way, including the NRA, if I'm not mistaken, you did not fill out I'm, the NRA. I, I will not fill out any special interest questionnaire. I'm going to be my own man. Can we talk tax policy? Sure. Uh, federal government, through uh, President Trump, Republican Congress, they decide, you know what, tax reform. We're going to cut certain taxes, uh, business taxes, I believe the capital gains tax cut as well. I, I, don't, I don't... Well, the business uh, tax was business. cut, my, my bad. Um, the $10,000 deduction, right, the cap on the yes. deduction, property taxes, massive in New Jersey, I uh, think, number one in the nation. It's unaffordable. State income tax, okay, fine. I happen to live in Montclair. No matter where you live, you know you're paying a lot in taxes. President of the Republican said, you know what, ten grand, that's it. In fact, a House committee dealing with this issue over the last few days said, that's it. IRS, lock this in. Don't let New Jersey or anyone yeah. else get out of that. Ten well, grand. Good deal? Bad deal. Bad deal. Let's be clear, Steve. Senator Menendez was on the Senate Finance Committee and sat in his hands, did nothing for the people of New Jersey. Maybe that cap could have been $15,000. to stop it? To, w w negotiate. Involve yourself. Don't just sit on the sidelines and ignore the interests of the people of New Jersey. Maybe it could have been a $15,000 cap, and, or it could have been tiered over time. He did nothing to protect the interests of the people of New Jersey. When I go there, I'm going to work to have that cap lifted. What we, should it be? It, it needs to be higher. It's unfair. New Jersey is so unaffordable. And remember, that's taking a subsidy away from New Jersey, which is bad for the state and bad for the people, mm -hmm. bad for property tax values, so many different things I could tell you about how it's bad. But you can't, you can't just sit here and say, we didn't do nothing about it. We got to go do something about it. And that's, Did you propose raising it to 15, 20 grand? I think we need to escalate it over time. Okay. But, but let's say we take that subsidy away. We've taken that subsidy away. 
We're 50 out of 50. We get the lease back from Washington. Where are people to say, give us something else in exchange mm -hmm. then? I was at Fort Monmouth last week. What a disgrace. The place is a ghost town. We lost $3 billion of economic activity a year while people in Washington sat on their hands, including Senator Menendez. Federal dollars to Fort Monmouth. Well, no, not, well, we lost 5,500 jobs, 10,000 contractors, right. but the economic value to the state was $3 billion. And, and you know what? The national taxpayer, as taxpayers, federal taxpayers, we didn't get a benefit from it either because the savings didn't materialize. Let's do this. Healthcare, real quick. Um, you are, are you concerned about the efforts to roll back, cut back the Affordable Care Act as originally constituted? Listen, the Affordable Care Act was a small step in the right direction in many ways, but also a bad step in some other directions. We, health care... What part do you like? What part don't you like? Well, listen, we need to expand coverage. I think the Medicaid expansion was a good thing. The focus on prevention and wellness, protecting patients with pre-existing conditions and absolute... All good. Absolute, all, all good. What don't, one thing you don't like. Oh, it was so bad for the working poor. It made people pay a premium. And in New Jersey, $80,000 family of four doesn't have $3,700. You didn't have insurance if you couldn't afford a $3,700 deductible for the bronze plan. It was really a fraud on the working poor. There were many good things, but many bad things. But the bad thing, Steve, about health care is it's a bigger issue. The American people deserve better care at lower costs. And, and I, I, I was on the board of Atlantic Health for 11 years, forward-looking, evolving a health care system, been involved in biotech 19 years. We need to do more for the American people for health care. Let's stay on the health care thing. Pharmaceutical prices, uh, you've seen ads, you've seen Mr. Hugan's ads on TV, you've seen Senator Menendez's ads. Yeah. Real quick on this. Um, reducing the price of pharmaceutical drugs and the effort that a Menendez camp, the Menendez campaign says, you know what, Bob Hugan, when he was head of Celgene, he fought to have generic drugs, a specific drug, um, specific generic drugs that would uh, potentially replace, is it, uh, let, me, let me get this right, uh, Revlimid, yep. Yeah. Re Revlimid. Okay, it's a cancer drug. Yes. The argument from the Menendez campaign is, you know what, Bob Eugen did not want a generic drug that was out there, wanted to stop that. They spent millions of dollars on lobbyists and others to stop it because it would have been cheaper for consumers, better profits for Celgene and for Mr. Eugen. You say? Steve, lies and mischaracterizations. Celgene's been investigated by the Obama administration and said, Never anything was it ever instigated against the company. The Obama Justice Department inter interviewed or investigated Senator Menendez and indicted him. Let's be clear. That company did a major reform in advancing the fight Any against cancer. Any fines have to be paid? No fines. No. There have been settlements, but no fines. The government has never found Sel Sel Selgin guilty. Selgin's never done anything that's improper and illegal. Absolutely. Just lies and mischaracterizations. The most generous patient assistance program in the world. And you think about increased R&D spending 37% a year, development. more than five times any price increases. 90% of, nearly 90% of all Celgene patients never paid more than $50 for their prescription. If all Americans could have the same kind of results and access to all medicines they have to Celgene's products, we'd be a much better country. I'm going to fight for that when we're in Washington. Mr. Hugan, let's do this. Uh, immigration. Yes. You need a wall? Listen, we need, we need to stop using immigration as a political football and a tool. There are people who don't want to solve this issue because they think it's politically better for them. We shouldn't have sanctuary cities. We should not pit one should law. Not have should not have sanctuary cities. We should not pit one law enforcement against the other. Every should we separate families as the no. Trump administration let, did? Let me, let me just say the Good. immigration. Sorry. No sanctuary cities. We need a secure border. You're not a country and a sovereign nation if you don't have secure borders. Control who comes in and who doesn't. Immigration has made this country great. My grandparents are immigrants. Same but here. we need comprehensive and compassionate immigration reform. We need better H-1B visas. Staple a green card to PhD can when they get a PhD degree for software, computer mm. science. They're job creators of the future. We can't run the tourism business or the agriculture industry in New Jersey if we don't have seasonal visas. But we need comprehensive and compassionate reform. People who are building a constructive and productive life in America should have a pathway to citizenship. Not shorter than people here illegally, but they should have a pathway to citizenship. Real quick, gun violence. Uh, again, you did not take the, uh, did not fill out the questionnaire from the NRA. Absolutely uh, not. One gun law that needs to be changed to, to, I, to potentially protect people from senseless gun violence. Yeah. You say, Mr. Eugen? You know, first of all, I put kids and teachers first. My sister's a retired school teacher from Union City, 35 years. Guns for teachers? No, I, I think each local community should decide what's best to protect their community and do it but whatever you don't like way. The idea. No, I, I don't think teachers should should be armed personally, but the local district should be in control of it. 
we need better background checks to make sure that people with mental illness that should not have access to any weapon, forget any weapon. So we, we need appropriate, strong laws, but we need also the right to protect our homes and our family. And sportsmen, I'm a fisherman more than a hunter, but people have the right to do sports and all the kind of hunting they want to do that's a fair and appropriate. Um, so I, I, think, I think New Jersey's leading the way in that regard, but we've got to make sure we put teachers and kids first. Bob Hugan. You're the Republican candidate for the United States Senate. It was not your plan to do this. No. Nope. You opted to do it, and we appreciate you coming in here on public television. You're seeing us on Fios, on the radio as well, a lot of places. We thank you. Uh, wish the best to you and your family, and thank you for responding to the questions. Thanks very much, Steve. Great to be with you. You got it. Right after this, folks, we're joined by the senior United States senator in New Jersey, Robert Menendez. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Welcome back, folks. I just want to remind everyone that on November 6th, there will be a very important election, not just for congressional seats in New Jersey and across the country in the House, but uh, key U.S. Senate races. Joining us now in one of those key races is the senior senator from the great state of New Jersey, United States Senator Robert Menendez. Good to see you, Senator. Good to be with you, Steve. Um, interesting. Donald Trump, you and I were talking before we got on camera. You have actually never met him. No, not, not before he became president, no. Okay. He did... There was a phone call we'll talk about later to you. Um, your impressions of him as president, as a leader, and if you could take policy out of it for a second, stylistically as a leader, impact on the nation. Go. Uh, I, I don't think he leads. I don't think he leads. He embraces the most authoritarian figures in the world and gives the back of the hand to our closest allies. He doesn't bring people together, as we expect of the president, in common cause. He divides us by who we are, what we look like, where we came from, and who we love. Uh, I expect a president who tries to bring the American people together. Uh, he doesn't uh, reach out in the Congress, unlike other presidents, including President Bush, who I served under, uh, to try to forge bipartisan compromise. So I, I, I don't think that those are the characteristics of a leader we want, particularly in the highest office in the land. Bob Bugin was here a couple days ago. We did the... Uh interview with him. He had very strong, clear things to say. So listen, I'll disagree with the president when I think he's wrong, and I'll agree with him when he's right. You say? I say uh, baloney. Uh, the reality is, is that he was Trump's finance chair in New Jersey, a delegate for Trump at the Republican Excuse Convention. Excuse me, Mr. Senator. He said, when I asked him that question, he said, he gave the money to the Republican National Committee. No, he, he gave some to Trump before he gave it to, uh, before he gave it to Chris Christie. Uh, when he was in the race. Then he gave it to Trump. Uh, then he also gave it to the Republican National Committee. He was a delegate for Trump at the convention. He was his finance chair in the state. But more importantly, he has consistently taken views along with the president that are against the interests of New Jersey. And he gives large, large amounts of money to the entities that support the president, like the Heritage Foundation. He gave them a half a million dollars. And that institution is opposed to everything he now says that he is a part of in New Jersey, a woman's right to choose, reasonable gun safety measures, the Affordable Care Act. All of a sudden, I don't give a half a million dollars. I don't have a half a million dollars, but I don't give a half a million dollars mm -hmm. to an entity that ultimately doesn't agree with all my core principles. That's who he is. He's another vote for President Trump. Now, you've been very critical of uh, <clears throat> Bob Eugen on the pharmaceutical side, said as the CEO of Celgene, you accused him uh, in your ads. I mean, you, you cannot miss these spots right up until the election on both sides. You said, you know what, as CEO, he really worked hard to keep generic drugs to people who were dealing with cancer because Celgene had a cancer drug that was more expensive. Do you really believe that? No question about it. Why would he do that? You know who says that? The President Trump's FDA commissioner called out Celgene as the worst company in the nation to stop generic drugs, cheaper drugs, from going to the marketplace. Signal them out. But beyond that, I think that Bob Eugen has a bigger problem. It's the $280 million that the federal government, uh, he ultimately uh, settled with the federal government for false uh, uh, pursuit of drugs off-label, meaning not what they were approved for. 
uh, for risking cancer patients, with potentially not letting them know about fatal side effects, for going after Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA system. Uh, and he settled for $280 million. That are, those aren't small potatoes. Ethically challenged? Well, look, I, I, and you know, the there, are many, there are many ways to think about ethics, right? But one thing I'll say is if you preyed upon those most vulnerable, which is what Bob Eugen and his company did, cancer uh, patients who needed that specific drug that he raised by over 200% while he was lowering it in Russia by 50%, that he was stopping generics from going to the marketplace here when he made a deal with a Russian company to do exactly that, have a generic version. When you prey among the most vulnerable, it says something about you. And so if you had the power of a United States senator, would you not be preying among the most vulnerable among us? Senator, you've been in public life for how long? In yeah, public life? Quick, quick, uh, quick over, 40, over 40 years. And you ran for the school board, if I'm not mistaken. It, it might have been 19 or 21. Yeah, I was 20 when I got elected. Okay. Yeah. So, long distinguished career. The question of ethics. The federal jury deadlocked in your case. The U.S. Justice, uh, Department of Justice opts not to bring a follow-up case. The United States Senate, the Ethics Committee, quote, severely admonishes you for, quote, accepting gifts from Dr. Solomon Melgan. The spots, again, you see them from Republicans and from Bob Eugen. You said you made mistakes. Could you be more specific? What mistakes do you actually feel you made, A and B? Um, could you understand a significant number of New Jersey and saying, I don't know if I trust Bob Menendez? Well, Steve, look, a couple things. First of all, as you noted, a federal judge exonerated us of the most significant charges. Uh, t 11 out of 13 jurors of average New Jerseyans said we don't believe in the government's case, and several of them severely criticized the government for even bringing the case. And then a Republican Department of Justice uh, ultimately dropped everything. So uh, at the end of the day, I, I regret that my understanding of the disclosure rules uh, were different uh, based upon what I saw other members actually disclose, not disclose, and based upon my own understanding of the rules. Uh, so I regret that. And before the Ethics Committee decided, before the government was involved, I amended and took care of virtually all of it. Uh, but what I have never made a mistake about is where I came from, who I'm fighting for, in this state. I'm fighting for everyday working families. I live that life. Bob Eugen is a multimillionaire. He doesn't live that life. Uh, I've lived a life. I'll, I have people judge my judgment uh, by when I, you know, bought a million people health care in New Jersey under the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. and eliminated pre-existing condition discrimination for 3.8 million New Jerseyans. I have New Jerseyans wonder whether my judgment is right when I passed into law the major legislation uh, on uh, autism for the state that has the highest rate of autism. I'll let them judge how I went to fight for them after Sandy and bought $60 billion to the region. And when the government turned its back on Sandy victims, I reopened those cases and got $300 million for average New Jerseyans who were denied by their government. So I'll let them judge the totality of my work and my history. Senator, let's shift gears. Um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Obama Care, if you will. Mm -hmm. What's your greatest concern about the potential of the federal government through the Trump administration changing, dismantling, doing whatever to the Affordable Care Act, which many argue, you included, is far from perfect. Oh, absolutely. Not a perfect law. We had dramatic change in health care in the country. But what did it do, Steve? And this is what I'm afraid that the Trump administration has systematically gone about trying to kill the Affordable Care Act, which means for a million New Jerseyans losing their health insurance which means for the 3.8 million New Jerseyans who have a pre-existing condition, the ability to be discriminated against as well. Uh, the, the lifetime caps that we eliminated mm. under the law so that if you had a serious illness, my, the Alzheimer that took my mother's life, uh, the costs that were involved, if she, hadn't, if she had lifetime caps, she'd be one illness away from losing everything mm. she ever had in life. <clears throat> so all of those uh, protections that were created on the Affordable Care Act, the expansion of health care, and attempts to cross control are in the midst of being undermined by the Trump administration as it stands in federal court saying that the law is unconstitutional. And Bob, respectfully, Senator, Bob Eugen says that he supports many aspects of the Affordable Care Act, but the ones that are onerous on individuals in terms of what they'd have to pay for their coverage, he's against. 
You, you, Bob, isn't Bob, your position Bob, similar Bob, to that? Bob Eugen wants to have it every which way. Uh, and I guess when you have no record other than having gouged cancer patients and made a killing off of them, uh, when you pay two hundred and eighty million dollars, is that the totality dollars? of his record as the CEO of Celgene? Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, he's on he's in that suit of the federal government. He's there bragging about how these two drugs were the drivers of Celgene's profit. But these are the two drugs that they were promoting for purposes not approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Two drugs that had fatal, potentially fatal side effects that they never let doctors and patients know about. Two drugs that they ultimately raised the prices of dramatically. So at the, the end FDA of the day... Approve, at, hold on, the FDA did not stop those drugs. Uh, oh, no, on the contrary. The FDA gave them a limited yes. approval. They went far beyond what they were approved for. And the FDA gave them warning after warning to stop what they were doing. My point is, you can't say, I like some of the Affordable Care Act, but I don't like all of it. You okay. can't say that I'm for a woman's right to choose and to give a half a million dollars to the Heritage Foundation that opposes a woman's right to choose. You can't say I'm for Judge Kavanaugh, who consistently has undermined in his decisions civil rights and, I believe, women's reproductive By rights. Way, as we do this program, that is in question, the, the Kavanaugh nomination. Real quick, if I do this, got about two and a half minutes, Senator. The role of the Department of Justice in terms of pursuing justice in criminal cases vis-a-vis -vis the role of the Trump administration in getting involved there, you say? Well, I say that, first of all, they, they, they should be going after the, the, the lady, you know, the information that Dr. Not Ford... Just that, I didn't mean just that case, but uh, oh, the president general. said, hey, listen, there are two Republican congressmen oh, yeah, who are this, being indicted by no. the uh, Department of Justice. What are you doing doing is, that? Is Telling a, Jeff, Jeff yeah. Sessions as the attorney general, what are you doing doing that? Is that appropriate no, this, for the United this, States this president? A, the, the, we expect that of dictators and tyrants in the world to use... Uh, law enforcement against individuals because of their politics or for them because of their politics, uh, not in the United States of America. It's a perversion of our system of justice. Can you do immigration real quick? Sure. Uh, you f you're for strong borders. you for the wall? No. Real quick, where do we need to go? Because where we are is not where most Americans want to be, Senator. Sure. Well, uh, we're, I want to be back where uh, what I did with John McCain when he was alive in the Gang of Eight passed in the Senate comprehensive reform, strong border protection, a pathway to legalization from the undocumented, a hard one, but a just one, the opportunity to think about future flows in immigration, what do we need in our workforce that we can't domestically achieve, uh, think about family reunification as continuing core value, which, by the way, Donald Trump is in the United States because his grandfather ultimately was brought in by a sister who claimed him under our family reunification. That ultimately led to him being born in the United States mm -hmm. and ultimately led to him being president. It's pretty ironic. So we can do much better. That never passed the House of Representatives. I want to return to that bipartisan agreement and give dreamers an opportunity to dream. I'm proud that I got President Obama to pass DACA, and now this president mm -hmm. has undermined it. Real quick, uh, how much of this race, 30 seconds left, how much of this race is about Donald Trump, how much about Bob Eugen? For you. Oh, it, it's going to be of what I achieved for New Jersey, and it's going to be about Eugen being another vote for Donald Trump. United States Senator, the senior senator of New Jersey, Bob Menendez. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank Stay you. right there. Again, folks, the election is on November the 6th. Um, this program, other great programs, particularly on public broadcasting, you'll find meaningful conversation about the issues that matter to you most. But democracy is not a spectator sport. So make sure you get out there and vote on the 6th of November. I'm Steve Adubato. Thank you so much for joining us. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, the law firm of Gibbons PC, New Jersey Resources. Summit Medical Group, Verizon, Delta Dental of New Jersey, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. And by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State. You may not have heard of TAVR. Raj and Sandhya have. It's the minimally invasive alternative to open-heart valve replacement. RWJ Barnabas Health is New Jersey's leading TAVR provider, and we continue to perfect it.
patients are often back to their lives in just a few days. Innovative valve replacement surgery. Because you can't be replaced. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources.